who have registered in this webinar international career opportunities in pharmacy practice field i hope dr wilson will, will clarify all your important doubts regarding career opportunities in international platform like that this in this webinar have a wonderful day thank you the opportunities given by pharmacy practice department seven hills college of pharmacy i hope dr wilson will enlighten you and take you in a greater heights thank you very much have a nice day jai hind over to dr sunil for further proceeding thank you sir thank you so much for the welcome speech now i am requesting dr robin george associate professor department of pharmacy practice for a introduction of dr alkin wilson sir good morning good morning to all uh, very respected uh, principal sir dr nirjan babu sir the pharmacy coordinator uh, dr b jyoti madam and all other uh, teaching faculties of seven hills college of pharmacy good morning and a very very uh, the respected uh, dr alkin wilson the icon of the day our speaker good morning sir and also to all my dear students of seven hills college of pharmacy as well as all other delegates from uh, various institute throughout india we got around 289 uh, registrations so somebody is live through the zoom and many are on a live streaming through youtube but good morning to all and uh, moving on to my responsibility allotted me is to introduce our uh, today's speaker dr algin wilson it's my pleasure privilege and much happy as well to introduce you Dr Algin Wilson uh, sir is currently holding the post of a research assistant in uh, McMaster University Collingwood Ontario Canada and uh, sir uh, skills and job responsibilities involves uh, conducting multiple researches simultaneously as a research assistant and uh, doing all the data processing like uh, maintaining the data integrity maintaining the privacy and confidentiality of the data converted the data sets into visual dashboards and infographics and also to have a brainstorming sessions with the research physicians and the program managers and also to conduct various research meetings events and uh, uh, cme programs as well and also making uh, various applications for the research grants applications drug approval applications and everything and also to navigate the quality improvement in uh, various research activities uh, being in the the post of a research assistant in McMaster University Collingwood University Collingwood uh, Ontario and uh, moving on to sir's uh, educational experiences the sir have uh, completed his pharmacy from RVS College of Pharmaceutical Sciences Coimbatore uh, under NGR Medical University and uh, followed by he have went for his uh, PG postgraduate certification program as research assistant uh, from uh, uh, Georgian College uh, Barrie Ontario Rio Canada uh, Barry Ontario Canada and sir have uh, completed his internship from the Collingwood uh, General Marine Hospital and uh, during all the semesters uh, has been enlisted in the dean's list of top scoring students list and uh, based on his um, uh, experiences and excellence in the area of research sir have awarded with mainly two awards that is John Flair research award by IPSOS from Georgian uh, College of Applied Applied Arts and Science Technology Canada, and also Sir was nominated for the award of en Enronics Group Award for Excellence in the Advancements of Social Research, and also Sir have got many funded projects uh, during his studies itself from the MGR Medical University, and the Sir was also have organized many CME programs, and moving on to Sir's work experiences, Sir have. Uh, worked uh, in um, uh, Loblaws Pharmacy Barrie Ontario during his study time as well as working time and also so has been the 
and the service also there in dubai as an in aster dm healthcare albas albazara dubai uae uh, for around one year and also sir is a peer reviewer of the journal uh, canadian medical association journal and ot international journal with this brief uh, introduction about uh, his uh, uh, scientific uh, his scientific uh, Oh, what achievements i also would like to quote that uh, personally he is a bible preacher and a teacher in a sunday school uh, for the uh, their churches also so with this uh, short note uh, i am hand overing the sessions to uh, dr algin wilson he proceeds uh, thank you dr robin george uh, for the wonderful intro uh, introduction um and um, thank you i would like to thank uh, dr uh, niranjan babu uh, and uh, seven hill pharmacy college for giving me this wonderful opportunity uh, to speak in the uh, international webinar for canadian um, opportunities for international graduates um and uh, i will also have, uh, have to mention the organizing committee and uh, uh, dr jodi and dr sunil kumar um uh, for uh, all this um, hard work they're doing behind the screen uh, and um, with that i think i can go start with the uh, session yeah. yes yes sir you may proceed yeah yeah uh, give me a few moments to share the screen sure sir <laughs> dear delegates if you anybody couldn't able to join in the zoom the youtube live stream is going on you can same uh, link also will be provided for the feedback and all you can continue there your friends anybody couldn't able to join in the zoom because of access number of uh, 100 we can continue in uh, youtube live thank you sir you can continue sir thank, thank you so you. much so uh the the topic today is prospective career options for international pharmacy graduates in canada uh so uh, there are two type of uh, pharmacy graduates in canada uh, obviously it's uh, the first one is uh, canadian pharmacy graduates who uh, got their graduation from a canadian university and the second one are international pharmacy graduates who uh, are came as immigrants um, from uh, different countries uh, they can, they maybe uh, coming as a permanent resident or maybe as a student Uh, as first, and then they uh, try to uh, get the pharmacy license and practice as a pharmacist. Uh, so, let us um, go through the uh, geographical map of Canada. Uh, Canada is a big country, and um, there's thirteen uh, provinces in Canada, and the one in here. Let me do the highlighting. So, sorry. Uh, the one in this side, it's this one is Atlantic Ocean, and these provinces. There are small, small, little, little provinces here. So these provinces are Atlantic provinces. Uh, so this one is Newfoundland, Labrador, and here a small island here. It's Prince Edward Island, and this one is Nova Scotia, and this is uh, this one uh, New Brunswick. so these are atlantic provinces uh, so they have all this um, ocean atmosphere in, in their province and uh, this bigger one it's quebec this one is the only french french speaking province in canada so most uh, canada have two official language one is uh, english and second one is french uh, and most of the canadians speak english and a few of the canadians speak french but in the province quebec uh 1995% uh of people are uh french speakers uh and only if you um are english speaking and that you will be uh, the immigrants from uh, different countries and uh they they are proud of their french um nationality thing uh and the next one is ontario uh this province uh have the capital city of canada and it's ottawa here in the bottom uh and uh you can see below ottawa there is toronto which is the biggest city in canada and it's in ontario and uh, most of the people in ontario are um living in the southern part of ontario and the northern part of ontario is very cold and 
um, it have all uh, it have polar bears and uh, Eskimos there. And uh, you can see uh, uh, this big uh, lake in here. It's it's called Hudson Bay, and it makes the uh, province more colder. And the middle provinces are Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Uh, they are kind of dry provinces. And then comes uh, Alberta and uh, British Columbia in the west. Uh, and there is a rocky mountain in between Alberta and British Columbia. And Alberta is one of the richest provinces. Uh, they have a lot of oil and gas resources. Even Saskatchewan and Manitoba have a lot of oil and gas resources. Uh, and uh, then comes British Columbia. Um, and climate-wise, British Columbia is like um, a good place because they have comparatively less snow. Um, before saying that, I have to say uh, six months is uh, winter in Canada and uh, six months is summer. So uh, during winter, you'll be uh, getting a lot of snows and all uh, the places will be covered with snow. But in British Columbia, most of the time, uh, it won't be snowing and, uh, and the, bad, the, the disadvantage is uh, most of the time it will be raining. Uh, well, personally, myself, I, I don't like rain. So um, personally, British Columbia is not my, uh, my thing. And uh, in the Northern Tree territories, uh, those are very cold and only less people live there. So uh, politically, uh, Canada have two parties, uh, conservative and liberals. Uh, and uh, now the cons uh, liberal party is ruling and uh, the prime minister is Justin Trudeau. And uh, I have uh, posted some picture of him and his family when they visited India. And they are with Honorable Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi. You can see them in here. And um, this Tim Hortons is an emotion for Canadians. Uh, it's a coffee uh, shop. And Tim Hortons uh, is a hockey player, uh, the greatest hockey player uh, in Canada. Basically, they, uh, they, uh, the sports in Canada is totally different from all over the world. Um, they don't have cricket and um, uh, football, and football is not as soccer in Canada. Uh, they have their own games like baseball and ice, ho ice hockey. Uh, so Tim Hortons is an um, ice hockey player, and uh, after um, he retired from his league uh, matches, he started a coffee shop, and it is the greatest uh, chain of coffee shop in Canada. And every, most of the people will be starting their day with Tim Hortons coffee. On their uh, way to work, they'll be going to the driveway of Tim Hortons and um, uh, they stop for a coffee and uh, go for the work. And uh, this is the um, um, picture of uh, some cities uh, in Canada. The one is, uh, the, the bigger one is Toronto and uh, the place is called Nathan Square. You can uh, bring your own um, skating shoe and you can uh, skate over the ice there and uh, the one in the uh, right bottom is Calgary and one in the left bottom is sorry right bottom is um, Vancouver in British Columbia and uh, Canada is a wonderful land of natural beauty uh, and um, uh, the, the, there's a lot of lakes and um, uh, water bodies and many um, Land, different landscapes, uh, mountains. Uh, it's it's rich in natural beauty, and um, um, so I have uh, posted some pictures of uh, some places. Uh, the first one, the bigger one, is obviously everyone know it's Niagara Waterfalls. Uh, half of the falls is in uh, Canada, and half is in uh, America. And uh, the best you you get the best view of the water wa waterfalls from Canada, so uh, we are lucky for that. And uh, down down the waterfall, there is a bridge. You can uh, cross the bridge to go to America. You can uh, they can cross the bridge to come to Canada, and um, um, you can go uh, into the uh, bottom of the falls so near uh, with the help of this cruise ship, uh, and it's it's a it's a wonderful view. Um, I, I, I don't have words to explain how beautiful is it. And uh, one in the uh, right um, bottom, it's uh, Lake Louise. Um, it's, it's a, it's a uh, big lake in the uh, mountains, uh, top in the mountains. And it's so, so peaceful, so wonderful place. 
and uh, the the picture down is some um, uh, uh, flower pot islands in Tobermory. Uh, so these are the flower pots uh, stones. It's those those stones are formed naturally, uh, and um, these stones are all around the island. Uh, and I don't know how it formed and all. Um, and uh, it's it's a big island in the Hudson Bay um, uh, Lake. Uh, and it's a wonderful place. So let's come to the uh, topic. Uh, so uh, the career options. So uh, basically there are a lot of uh, career options for pharmacists uh, in Canada. Um, so most of the pharmacists want to practice as a pharmacist, uh, but uh, that is the toughest one to pursue because uh, you need uh, to get uh, the pharmacy license uh, to practice as a pharmacist, even as a community pharmacist and um, uh, when hospital pharmacy or clinical pharmacy. Uh, and the hos uh, hospital pharmacy, uh, but the clinical pharmacy is a fancy term in Canada. Um, like, um, uh, the, there is no specific um, thing that, that you have to do to become a cl clinical pharmacist. Um, all pharmacists, uh, all the pharmacists who have the license can become a clinical pharmacist or a hospital pharmacist. Um, uh, but there is nothing like uh, you have to do PharmD to be a clinical pharmacist, or you, um, only if you did, did BPharm, you will be going to community pharmacy. That, that's not happening in Canada um, because uh, all the community hospital clinical pharmacists, they all uh, have the um, same skills. Uh, they, they, are practicing, they are practicing the same skills um, uh, in, even in the hospital or in community. Um, um, you cannot, um, there, there, there is difference, but uh, there is not much huge difference. Um, yeah. So, um, and then comes the research and development area. So there's a lot of uh, opportunities in research and development. Uh, and um, um, like, uh, you know, in pharmacovigilance, there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of companies in, uh, in Canada. Um, um, and there are a lot of core companies like um, uh, Pfizer, Ab Abbott, um, uh, and um, I, nothing coming up in my mind right now. Uh, and uh, sale, you can work as a sales representative for different companies. And um, you can get a job in regulatory affairs, and you can also um, work in academia uh, in teaching and research. So coming to the uh, first one, community pharmacy. Uh, so there are um, 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 four, sorry, five types of community pharmacy in Canada. Uh, first one is franchisee. Uh, so um, basically, uh, franchisee is something like a chain of pharmacy. Um, the most common franchises in Canada is uh, Shoppers Drug Mart, Walmart Pharmacy, sorry, uh, Walmart Pharmacy, and Loblaw Pharmacy. They are they are chain of pharmacies. Uh, so um, like uh, they all are coming under one director. So um, and like there, there are a lot of branches of pharmacy in different locations. So that that is basically a franchise pharmacy, uh, and all the pharmacies are owned by uh, the uh, franchisee, the one person. So that is franchise pharmacy or, or the one company. So that is pharm, pharm, uh, franchise pharmacy. For example, um, for example, um, uh, Shoppers Drug Mart Canada. So uh, there is a director for that, and uh, they have different pharmacy in different location in Canada, and all the pharmacies are owned by this company, um, Shoppers Drug Mart Canada, or the Walmart Pharmacy. All the Walmart ph pharmacies are owned by um, this company, Walmart, and um, all the independent pharma, all the uh, single single pharmacies are. Uh, governed by the pharmacy manager. They appoint a pharmacy manager in each, each pharmacy and they will be uh, managing uh, everything and they have to report uh, their sales and all things to the uh, franchisee. And, um, and the pharmacy managers cannot uh, take independent decision 
they have to follow the standard operating procedure of the company. Uh, so uh, there is restrictions for them to um, uh, to put on put up on their own ideas. So that's basically fantasy pharmacy. And uh, the second one is banner pharmacy, uh, which which is uh, like a different category, like um, um, IDA, Rexile. These are ki uh, kind of examples for banner pharmacy. If if I'm going too fast, uh, you can stop me at any time and uh, ask me to slow down. Uh, I hope um, you now uh, everyone won't be hesitated to stop me. It's completely welcome. Thank you, and sir. I, we are following you. Thank you. And uh, um, so, example is Idea Pharmacy and Rexel Pharmacy. So, uh, those companies are not owning all the individual farmers. So, they are just giving their name and uh, and they will get a, a fee for that. For example, if, if I want to put up an Idea Pharmacy, uh, I will uh, take their banner, Idea banner, and stick on my pharmacy. And I will pay them yearly, uh, but the pharmacy is completely mine, and uh, I'll be taking all the profit, and I'll be implementing all my ideas, and no help will be there from the ban uh, the company. Um, so basically, an independent pharmacy, but I'm putting up on a company's banner uh, in my uh, on my pharmacy. So that's banner pharmacy. Uh, but uh, the uh, disadvantage is there is not much great support uh, from uh, uh, a third party uh, or an, any other person. Um, all uh, it's it's a little bit riskier than franchise pharmacy because in franchise pharmacy you are not owning anything, but uh, basically you will be uh, uh, paying the uh, you will be paid the salary plus the uh, bonus, um, and um, the independent. Uh, and uh, the advantage for the franchisee pharmacy and banner pharmacy is they they have a branding already, so uh, they don't need to do an advertisement or um, anything. It's 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 branded in uh, all every people's head, so uh, that's an advantage for them. Uh, that's why uh, the banner pharmacies are also uh, coming in light um, because by using their banner. Uh, uh, the uh, pharmacy will be getting an automatic advertisement. And uh, the independent pharmacy, independent pharmacy is um, uh, completely owned by an independent person and there won't be any banner. Um, he won't be doing a banner from other company. Um, he will be um, uh, the sole proprietor of the pharmacy. And uh, the disadvantage, disadvantage is he, he has to do his own advertisement and everything. And um, another disadvantage is uh, in in the franchisee and banner pharmacy there is a there is a lot of uh, there is a group of pharmacies. So um, the uh, the wholesaler uh, of the medicine they'll be giving a, a good discount uh, for the franchisee and banner pharmacy because uh, there is a group of pharmacies. But in independent pharmacy, uh, uh, if they approach the wholesaler for uh, uh, getting the uh, um, drugs. Uh, they won't be getting much discount because they are uh, just single pharmacy. So, um, but the new strategies uh, done by the independent pharmacy is uh, the all the independent owners in the area they uh, combine together and approach a uh, wholesaler. So they'll be getting a um, good discount from the wholesaler. And uh, compounding pharmacy, uh, compounding pharmacy is um, uh, it, it's this idea was. Um, um, very old in Canada and America, but uh, in if you see in the Middle East, uh, uh, like Dubai and all, uh, uh, this idea is growing now. But in in Canada, this idea um, is not that popular. Um, only some will be using this compounding pharmacy because uh, they compound uh, the medicine um, at the um, at the pharmacy itself, and um, they will be. Um, um, giving only the appropriate dose. Uh, so uh, like uh, for some medicine, uh, only particular dose will be uh, uh, available in market uh, from the uh, different companies. But uh, if a patient need um, a, a particular dose, which is not manufactured by the companies, then they will be approaching compound farms. Or like uh, they need like um, some specific um, compound medicine, like 
um, hormone, like for some hormone therapy or for some uh, um, uh, some creams and oil mills, they'll be approaching compounding pharmacy. Uh, uh, so uh, basically, it's an old idea in America, but it's um, it's coming on to Middle East. And next one is uh, and and the compounding pharmacy. It's only for compounding compound medicine. Uh, they won't be selling uh, the regular medicine. Hello. Hello, Algin, sir. Hello. Hello, Algin. Algin sir, hello. Hello. Dear delegates, uh, please stay on the line. Uh, some technical glitches, it seems. We'll resolve in, uh, in uh, one minute. Hello, uh, is it is it audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now it is audible. Okay. Sorry about that. No issues, sir. It's a part of technical glitches. Thank uh, you. Yeah. You can start sharing, sir. Now. Um, hello, is it audible now? Sir, it's audible now. And you can see the screen, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And no uh, can you uh, just inform me where where did I broke up? So I can sir, start. Franchisee, franchisee slide. Next slide. Oh, franchisee. Okay. Yes, yeah. sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, so um, 
franchisee of pharmacy. Uh, it's um, it's already, I, I think I have already explained about that. And the thing what I was about to say is there is a drop-off station and a pickup station. So uh, the patient will be coming into the drop-off station and they drop off the prescription um, and we'll be entering the prescription in the system. And uh, then there is a lot of other station for the workflow. I'll be explaining that in the end. And then uh, they pick up in the pickup station. And there will be a consulting room if the pharmacists want to consult, uh, or like uh, educate the patient or um, say something about their uh, medication, uh, they'll be going to the consultation room. And if, if there is nothing much to be said, uh, then uh, they'll be uh, um, just picking up the medication and going. Uh, and uh, this is another um, example of a franchise pharmacy. So Walmart pharmacy is, I, I, I put, the, put up this um, picture because I want to, in, um, I want you to understand the situation. Like uh, the Walmart pharmacy, is, Walmart is a, um, um, a superstore, a grocery store, and the pharmacy is inside the grocery store. So uh, you can see people with their uh, shopping cart uh, waiting on the uh, pharmacy line. So uh, uh, basically everything is in the uh, grocery store, even the medicine is in the grocery store. Uh, so I want, it, it's, it's not seen in India. So I want you um, to see this one. That's why I put up this picture. Uh, and uh, banner pharmacy, uh, um, I have already explained about banner, how, how the banner pharmacy is working. Uh, and these are some examples of the company, IDA and Guardian and uh, the medicine shopping pharmacy. These are uh, banner pharmacies. But, uh, as I said, uh, they, are, they only have the banner of this company, but uh, the company is not owner of the uh, pharmacy. Um, they are only uh, good for advertising. So the workforce in the pharmacy is the, uh, obviously the pharmacist, and then comes the pharmacy technician, sorry, uh, and then comes pharmacy assistant. So um, a pharmacist will be the licensed pharmacy, a pharmacist uh, with the, um, they'll be licensed in a specific province. Each province will be having a different um, criteria for registration of pharmacists. So they'll be, if, if the pharmacist is practicing in Ontario, they'll be uh, uh, registered with the College of uh, Pharmacy Ontario and um, uh, and the pharmacist will be the sole responsible person of the pharmacy, uh, whatever happening in the pharmacy, he or she will be the responsible person. Mm. And uh, a pharmacy technician uh, is, um, they, it's it's kind of a diploma uh, uh, program in Canada uh, to help the pharmacist. So uh, uh, pharmacists have the whole responsibility, but pharmacy technician has some responsibility. But um, uh, pharmacy assistant um, does not have any responsibility. It's solely for assisting the pharmacy technician and pharma the pharmacist. So um, a pharmacist can. Uh, um, all the prescription that's go, that goes out of the pharmacy should be verified and uh, checked by the pharmacist. A uh, pharmacy uh, technician can do all the inventory work and also they can take the prescription and um, um, they can um, 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 transfer the prescription from one pharmacy to other pharmacy and they can um, intake the uh, prescription from other pharmacy. So uh, that is also another thing in uh, Canada um, pharmacy thing because uh, if if for example if a patient came to the pharmacist with a prescription and he in in the prescription he has like four refills of uh, med, med, like for example he came uh, with the prescription for rosuvastatin with uh, ninety tablets with four refills so um, uh, we'll be putting that in our pharmacy uh, file and uh, we'll be dispensing the first refill. Uh, and he'll be going. And later uh, he might have moved to some other place, but he has three more refills in, in file. So uh, he uh, requests us to uh, transfer the prescription from here to the pharmacy he wants. So we'll be transferring the prescription to that pharmacy. So that's transfer of prescription. 
the, uh, likewise, we, we, we get transfer in of the prescription from other power plants. So pharmacy technician can do those things and a pharmacy technician can take verbal prescription from a prescription. But pharmacy assistant is solely for the uh, for helping pharmacists and pharmacy technician. Uh, but um, um, he or she can can have uh, cannot have any role in uh, the clinical side uh, or uh, any any responsible side. Like uh, they cannot recommend uh, any OTC medicine. They cannot do uh, counseling. They cannot receive the prescription. Uh, they only can do a clerical job. Um, uh, and that is pharmacy assistant. So uh, here is the pharmacy workflow. So uh, so you can see it's the first step is intake of the prescription. Uh, patient will be coming into the pharmacy and giving the prescription. So pharmacist or pharmacy technician will be taking the prescription and verifying it. And uh, input of prescription can be done by pharmacist, pharmacy technician, or pharmacy assistant. And filling of the prescription can be done by anyone. Uh, it's uh, filling of the prescription is basically uh, like um, uh, collect the uh, the the mostly the uh, uh, medicines will be in the bottle for bottle in, in pharmacy. Um, all the tablets will be in a big huge bottle, and uh, we count the tablets. Uh, with um, a plate and spatula and uh, put it in a new vial and label it and give to patient. So that's filling. So um, pharma anyone, a pharmacist, pharmacy technician or pharmacy assistant can do the filling uh, and verification uh, of the uh, uh, fill the prescription can be done by um, uh, pharmacist only. Um, pharmacist, has, pharmacist has to verify all the um, um, details are correct. Uh, uh, he or she has to count uh, the medicine again if it's controlled one, um, and um, um, he or she has to check the labeling and everything proper. Uh, and uh, and when patient comes for pickup, uh, need to bill it and give uh, to the patient. And if patient need consultation, they'll be going to the room, uh, the consultation room, and doing the consultation. And uh, this is the main work of pharma uh, pharmacist, but that's not only the uh, scope of pharmacists now in Canada. Uh, now the pharmacists are responsible for vaccination. Uh, so er, um, in Canada, uh, the flu season starts by uh, October. So uh, by mid October, uh, the um, flu shot, the influence of vaccination will be happening. So uh, pharmacists have a good scope in that and. It will be very rush um, during those months, October, November, December, with the, all the flu shot and everything. And also they are uh, doing the COVID vaccination shot. And um, uh, and they are also doing the uh, other, like um, chicken box vaccine, uh, hepatitis vaccine, uh, or a pneumococcal vaccine. All, all the vaccination uh, are also the scope of pharmacists now. And uh, there are other programs also done by the pharmacist. Um, so um, um, basically the scope of pharmacies is increasing in Canada and um, there are now prescription, uh, prescribing authorities are given to the pharmacist, even in the community pharmacy. And, um, um, and what else? Uh, so um, basically, um, and there's another uh, interesting, uh, um, rights given to the pharmacist is de-prescribing. Um, so basically, um, if prescription, uh, sorry, if physician um, uh, writes a lot of prescription and the patient come to the pharmacy with the prescription, and if the pharmacist think that some of the medicine is not necessary, he can de-prescribe it. He can, uh, he has the authority to not to give that to the patient uh, without even consulting the physician. The pharmacist can be prescribed the prescription, uh, um, and uh, that 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 scope is growing growing a lot in Canada because uh, the physicians uh, um, maybe some patients will be using PPIs for a longer duration of time. Uh, so you know, do, uh, using PPIs for a longer duration has a lot of side effects, uh, especially in uh, the elderly, the geriatrics. So. Um, 
um, the pharmacist will be having access to the uh, uh, um, the um, the history of medication taken uh, by the patient. Um, they have their own system, and also they have access to the um, um, government system um, because it's it's very necessary to access the government system also because if the patient have taken something from other pharmacy, the patient uh, the pharmacist won't be uh, knowing that. So it's it's important to look onto the government system also. Um, to check whether the patient have taken um, medicines from other pharmacies and what are the medicines and um, uh, is it necessary to prescribe. And also uh, looking into that system, uh, the government system is uh, important um, for the patient uh, whom the pharmacist suspect they are misusing the control medicine. So if uh, if they, they, they sometimes have... Um, uh, taken the uh, medicine from other pharmacy and uh, they also come to our pharmacy and give us the same prescription. So uh, we have to check in the system whether he has already got enough number of uh, medicine for that and um, from other pharmacy or like it's very important in Canada to check the history, medication history of pharmacy, uh, sorry, medication history of patient um, from other uh, pharmacies also to avoid overdosage of medication and also properly counseling the patient. So uh, that's the scope of the prescribing uh, in um, thing and um, in, a, in Canada. And then comes the methadone clinic and opioid crisis. Opioid crisis is a, a big issue in uh, Canada right now uh, because a lot of people are addicted to opioid and um, Mm, and opioids are like easily available and the prescription, uh, sorry, physicians are prescribing opioid a lot um, because uh, um, a few decades back, uh, the prescription, uh, the physicians were like um, inappropriately uh, prescribing opioids for patients and that has caused an opioid um, addiction in uh, North America. Uh, so, um, and uh, the drug overuse um, death are also increasing in Canada and a lot of young people are also addicted to uh, uh, opioid. Uh, so um, the uh, government of Canada is giving away a naloxone kit. Um, so, you know, uh, naloxone is the uh, anti um, uh, dot for um, the opioid. So, um, you know, uh, overdose of opioid may cause um, respiratory uh, shutdown uh, because they act on the mu receptor um, and uh, with the respiratory shutdown they uh, the patient will be going into death uh, so to prevent the death with um, uh, opioid use uh, the government of canada is uh, giving out naloxone kit uh, that can be an ingestion form or nasal spray form uh, that will be given out uh, for free uh, through the pharmacies to the community. Uh, like anyone uh, who is an opioid user or anyone who is a friend or a family member of an opioid user uh, can get this kit or even, even that category is not necessary. That, that criteria is not necessary. Anyone can get this uh, naloxone kit from any pharmacy in Canada. Uh, and uh, if you see someone um, with the, um, opioid over, overdose, uh, you can use the naloxone kit uh, on them and you can call 911 and uh, ship them to the hospital. So uh, that, 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 that's the use of naloxone kit and it, it's given away free in uh, Canada. And uh, methadone clinic are uh, if if an um, opioid user and it's, it's the naloxone kit is not only for the uh, drug addicted patient, also opioid naive patient. Uh, like um, opioid naive patient means uh, if, if if a patient is prescribed uh, first time with an opioid, uh, he is uh, having a greatest chance of getting this respiratory distress, uh, respiratory failure. Um, or even if he is prescribed a higher dose or, or more potent opioid, uh, then also he'll be at risk of this opioid. Um, the uh, overdose problem. So um, while we uh, in the pharmacy, while we give out the, the prescription, we dispense the prescription for 
opioid, we will also um, counsel the patient and give the naloxone kit to them. Um, so they can, uh, they or their family member can save their lives if um, they go into a respiratory failure uh, or other opioid symptoms. And uh, so uh, if a patient, uh, if a drug uh, overuse addict, uh, she really want to get rid of this, this addiction, uh, then uh, he can uh, come to the methadone clinic and um, the um, pharmacist will be giving uh, them their daily methadone dose uh, for one month. So, um, so uh, with that, he'll be able to reduce his um, drug overuse and basically then uh, eventually he will be able to get rid of his addiction. Uh, and um, uh, some patient might be uh, misusing them. So uh, it, uh, it's the law that uh, the pharmacist has to, give and give, has to give the methadone to the patient mixed with an orange juice to the patient. So if, if it's mixed with orange juice, he cannot like take it and inject it to himself orange juice. So it has to be uh, mixed with orange juice uh, and given to the patient. And the patient has to drink it before in front of the uh, pharmacist. Uh, and um, and once in a while, he has to come to the uh, pharmacy and give his urine for testing. Um, so um, uh, pharmacist will be knowing that he will be com uh, um, in compliance with the medicine. He won't be skipping doses and all. And uh, that's the uh, one form. And uh, and you know there are a lot of practical difficulties in that. So there is a new medicine for that. It's uh, Sabotsort. It's, it's a combination of buprenorphine uh, and um, uh, naloxone. Uh, so uh, buprenorphine, uh, you know, it's a, it, it, buprenorphine is also an opioid uh, medicine, uh, but they are partial agonist in mu and partial agonist kappa. So it's a partial agonist. So it won't be uh, giving the patient that high uh, in a short period of time. And also, it's a combination of naloxone. So, if if they the patient, it's a sublingual tablet. If the patient takes in by mouth, uh, the buprenorphine will be having that um, opioid action a little bit, and the naloxone will be inactive orally. Uh, but if if the patient uh, this uh, if the patient decide to uh, dissolve the drug and inject it himself, then uh, the naloxone will be uh, inactive in uh, in the um, blood. If 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 he inject, sorry, uh, my pardon. Uh, if if he decide to take uh, it, um, dissolve in the water and inject it himself uh, to get the buprenorphine high effect, um, it won't work because the, it's a combination of naloxone. So uh, buprenorphine and naloxone will be opposing each other's action and it will be neutralized. So that's why uh, we are adding naloxone in that tablet. Uh, if the patient decides to misuse the tablet, he won't be able to do that. So uh, that's the uh, um, the uh, logic behind that. So I think a lot of you are interested in uh, hearing this one uh, rather than the research field. Um, and I, um, I, I am also my uh, way to get my pharmacy license. Um, um, I, I, I'm on my paternity leave right now, and it's uh, um, Canada having eight months of paternity leave. So this, I think uh, I can make use of that uh, paternity leave to get um, uh, past the uh, pharmacy licensure exam. So I'm working on that. So I think uh, I can be a good help for you, um, a good guidance to you to uh, walk through the uh, procedure of how to get uh, a license in uh, uh, Canada. So, um, um, just a minute.
Um, sorry for the interference. Um, uh, I think you can uh, see the uh, yes, uh, presentation and you can hear me. Um, yes, sir, uh, yes, sir. I apologize for uh, the... Uh, um, no issue, sir. Please continue, sir. So, um, as you know, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, the Pharmacy Examination Board, Examining Board of Canada is the uh, authority uh, to conduct all the exam and um, um, state that uh, yeah, this candidate is uh, qualified to uh, get license. But they are not the one who are giving you the license. It's each, each province uh, are giving you the license, like College of Pharmacy Ontario or College of Pharmacy Alberta. So each province have their own College of Pharmacy. Um, uh, the College of Pharmacy is, is not an institution uh, to study. It's a it's a group of uh, it's a group of professionals. Uh, that's the meaning of, meaning of college. Um, so um, the procedure is um, there is uh, three uh, step in a PBC certification process for international pharmacy graduate. The first step is document evaluation. So first of all, they have to, uh, the EPC has to evaluate your qualification uh, and uh, give you a uh, certificate that yes, you are qualified to write the exam, uh, the evaluating exam uh, of PBC. So for that, you have to send your uh, degree certificate and your um, uh, transcript uh, from university uh, to the uh, PEPC. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, after you send all the certificate uh, to PEPC, then uh, you'll be uh, given the certificate. Yes, you are eligible to attend the pharmacy evaluating exam. So, uh, and uh, the, the fee for document evaluation would be like uh, um, seven, below 700 uh, Canadian dollar. Uh, and uh, the second step will be a pharmacist evaluating exam. So uh, the pharmacist evaluating exam will be uh, conducted two times a year. Um, it, the, there will be a, a winter examination and a summer examination. So the winter examination will be on uh, January uh, and the second of summer exam will be on June. And after uh, the uh, um, after you pass the pharmacist evaluating examination, oh, I, I forgot to tell the fee for that. It's uh, almost nine below nine hundred uh, Canadian dollar uh, for pharmacist evaluating exam. And if you pass the pharmacist evaluating exam, you are qualified to attend pharmacist qualifying examination part one and part two. The part one will be MCQ type, uh, and part two will be OSCE. So. Um, Pharmacist evaluating exam is also MCQ type examination, and they have 200 questions uh, for that. And there is no negative uh, scoring. And uh, um, the thing is, there will be some dummy questions uh, which don't have any mark. Like uh, if you answer the question correctly, or if you answer the question wrongly, that question does not carry any mark. So that's the trickiest part in, in um, Canadian. Uh, pharmacy exam, uh, and uh, you have to score sixty percentage to uh, pass the exam. And uh, when uh, coming to the pharmacist qualifying examination part one, it's MCQ exam, uh, but in that one is a little more tougher examination, uh, and um, uh, it's same like the evaluating exam, but a little more like uh, difficult. And and part two OSCE exam, it's kind of um, uh, in-person uh, interview thing, uh, you have to uh, patient counsel um, someone uh, who uh, the the examiner will be coming in front of you as a patient or patient caregiver uh, or patient's mother or parent. So uh, then uh, you have to counsel them, and um, that's the OSCE exam. Um, it's easy, but it's also trickier, and. Um, um, you can take part one or part two um, um, first. It, it doesn't matter. You can take OSCE first and appear MCU, or you can take MCQ first and appear OSCE. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, and um, um, this one also costs you like $900 for exam. And 
Um, and uh, the, the other interesting fact is that um, the international graduates are going through the step one, step two, and step three. Uh, but the Canadian grads, they are directly coming to the step three. So basically, it's not only for you, it's also for the Canadian graduates. So they also have, after they, um, they graduate from the um, uh, university in Canada, they have to appear for the qualifying examination, MCQ, and OSP um, for uh, getting the license. So uh, it's, they're not discriminating between uh, the foreign pharmacist and the Canadian pharmacist. The, for, everyone has to take this test. Only thing is, the only extra thing is pharmacists evaluating exam. Uh, the evaluating exam is to segregate the uh, um, quality, uh, to just segregate the quality of uh, international graduates. And uh, after you passing the um, uh, both part, part one and part two of MCQ, um, of the qualifying exam MCQ and OSCE, then uh, you have to pass uh, pass the uh, jurisprudence exam in the in the province you want to practice. If you want to practice in Ontario, you have to pass Ontario jurisprudence exam, and also you have to do an IELTS or any other English language proficiency test. And uh, then you have to uh, apply for the um, uh, license, and you'll be getting the license. So it's a, it's a long process, uh, but uh, a little by little you can achieve it because there are many people who have uh, done this and done this before you, and also there are many people who are going to do this after you. So it's also possible for you to uh, this. It's 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 difficult but not impossible. And um, uh, yeah, it's, I'm not to terrify you, but. Um, 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 it, it's it's not that uh, the uh, Canadian pharmacy exam is um, even tougher than the NAPLETS uh, that's in America, uh, tougher than NAPLETS. So let's see the PEBC syllabus. So um, um, this is the syllabus breakdown. Uh, the first one is uh, biomedical sciences. It carries only 50% uh, of the uh, mark. And uh, pharmaceutical sciences carry on uh, 25 percentage, and pharmacy practice carries 50 percentage, and behavioral, social, and administrative pharmacy science carry 10 percentage. And it's uh, and uh, uh, the new update is that now it's more of clinical. Um, you you won't be getting like a lot of um, pharmacology, pharmaceutical questions, more of a practical approach questions. Um, like many questions are in the gray area, you have to be uh, um, very careful in uh, selecting the uh, right option. So um, I'll explain uh, uh, what each of the category uh, carries. Uh, like uh, biomedical sciences, 50 percentage. Uh, it has biochemistry, genomics, and molecular biology, physiology, and functional anatomy, immunology medical mic microbiology. So um, um, you, you can see it's, it's only 15 percentage and there's uh, another five subtopic in, in that. So each topic, topic will be carrying off about uh, three percentage of mark. So um, uh, won't be uh, useful spending a lot of time in this one, but have an overall idea and they will be asking only simple question from this. And pharmaceutical science, uh, it carries uh, twenty five percentage. Uh, so, uh, and uh, if you uh, if you concentrate, it's it's easier to score from this category. Uh, pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutics and drug delivery system, pharmacokinetics and pharmaco uh, sorry biopharmaceutics, medicinal chemistry, pharmacology, toxicology and clinical toxicology, biotechnology and by uh, pharmacogenetics and. Um, if you, in this part, if you uh, concentrate more on pharmacology, in, it's it's waste of your time because uh, the most commonly asked pharmacology questions will be, what's the drug class, what's the mechanism of action? Uh, and uh, and that will be more of the pharmacology questions you get from uh, uh, for PABC. And next comes the uh, the biggest uh, one that's pharmacy practice. It carries fifty percentage overall, and 
Uh, it's break down to two subcategory, clinical science, 35 percentage and professional practice skills, 15 percentage. So uh, you have to concentrate a lot on this and uh, never score oh. and um, try to score maximum on the pharmacy practice uh, session and uh, there is a greater chance for you to pass. If you score all the 50 percentage from pharmacy practice, then you, you can get, you you have to score only a 10 from other one and also uh, it will be useful for your uh, uh, the clinical practice when you get licensed so in clinical sciences sciences there will be pathophysiology clinical biochemistry and laboratory and diagnostic testing pharmacotherapeutics including prescription non prescription and complementary therapy health promotion and disease prevention patient care pro process uh, like assessment, intervention, monitoring, follow-up, documentation, and special population, including geriatrics, pediatrics, pregnancy, lactation, nutrition, and you'll be getting a lot of questions of drug interaction, uh, like uh, SIP interaction, uh, cytochrome enzyme SIP interaction, uh, and um, um, enzyme in Hello. Hello, Algin, sir. Hello. Dear delegates, feedback link will be provided uh, in a short time. And uh, once you fill the feedback link, you will get the certificate through your mail. So please be on the line until the program ends. Thank you. And uh, some technical glitches from the resource person site because of some network issue will resolve it soon and uh, make it continue the session. Thank you for waiting. I apologize once again, and um, I uh, hope you can see the screen and hear me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. And uh, can you just uh, say where did I stop?
it's a pharmacy practice things uh, you are saying sir uh, pharmacy practice uh, yeah Scoring more mark in pharmacy practice will be the easy way to catch up the uh, exam. Yeah, yeah. So, so you that we need like only less mark in other. Fifty percentage of mark yeah. for pharmacy practice, uh, and uh, total you need sixty percentage to pass. So if you get another ten percentage from other than the other fifty percentage of syllabus, then you will be able to pass easily. So. Um, so uh, if you more focused on uh, pharmacy practice area you can uh, pass the exam uh, very well easily and um, uh, the um, the uh, syllabus i i uh, it's it's not, i think it's not necessary to read out all the syllabus in here uh, and i have shared the uh, ppt with uh, um, the organizing committee so uh, i think they can give you the the uh, PPT to you, so you can read all the the, the syllabus when you have time. And sure, sir. I moved to behavioral, social, and administrative pharmacy science. It it has ten percentage uh, weightage, and um, uh, it also easy to score. And then comes the research career, uh, and uh, as you as you know, pharmacovigilance is the uh, first uh, one. Um, uh, pharmacovigilance have good scope in India and as well as in uh, uh, Canada, uh, and there are a lot of companies uh, doing pharmacovigilance in in Canada. And um, uh, that's uh, as you all know, pharmacovigilance is phase four uh, of the clinical trial. So uh, you'll be mostly doing the uh, um, um, uh, data data management and. Um, um, documentation things, uh, and then comes clinical trial. Clinical trial, uh, as you know, uh, uh, have studied phase zero, phase one, phase two, phase three of the clinical trial. The phase zero is with the animals, phase one uh, is with a uh, smaller population. And uh, as you climb the phase, you uh, be increasing the population and increasing the scope of study. And clinical trials are done in um, um, different university um, site and also in different hospitals um, and a lot of pharmaceutical companies will be doing that and um, you you can uh, get a job in there also um, with, with, and uh, the, for pharmacovigilance and pharmaco the clinical trials all the research field you do not need a pharmacy license to uh, get a job so that's the uh, most um, um, fascinating part of this research career. And you don't need to go uh, all these tedious steps of uh, licensing procedure. Um, and uh, pharmacological and pharmaceutical research, it also done in the universities and uh, uh, the um, pharmaceutical companies, uh, pharmaceutical firms. Uh, so um, these, these research career does not require uh, you to be registered as a pharmacist. Uh, but there are some of the skills that you need, uh, some soft skill as well as some hard skill, some technical skills such as um, some um, research tool, experience in some research tool or some, some kind of certification like clinical uh, trial certification. You can, you can take up some um, uh, clinical trial um, uh, research courses or uh, patient uh, uh, medication safety course, uh, something like that. The, the, there are many certificates, certification courses. And yeah, even sometimes it's not required for the companies for you to take up that uh, courses. After you are hired, they will be giving you training on that. So uh, uh, um, it's pretty much easier to get a job in these categories. Uh, and um, I'm going to walk you through my journey. So uh, I'm a research analyst at um, uh, Collingwood General Marine Hospital. So Collingwood General Marine Hospital is a research site of McMaster University. Uh, it's, a, it's an educational and research site. So um, basically, uh, um, uh, there, there, there are a lot of um, medical graduates coming for their residency. Uh, and uh, uh, they are also involved in the education and research of uh, that. And it's it's a rural area. Um, that uh, the town has only twenty thousand people, 
uh, but it's uh, it's important for rural education and rural uh, healthcare research. Uh, and health uh, research analyst can be uh, tamed as um, research assistant or clinical research analyst or research coordinator. All these terms go in hand. Uh, like all these terms are interchangeable, so don't confuse with the terms. But uh, basically, uh, the most commonly used term is research analyst. Uh, so uh, uh, I complete my uh, PharmD graduation from RBS College of Pharmacy in 2017. And uh, then in 2018, I got enrolled in the Georgian College Research Analyst Postgraduate Program. Uh, and um, uh, and um, that, that's a wonderful program uh, to um, get all the basic of the research methodology and scope of research uh, in different fields. And uh, the coursework of the, uh, um, of the program uh, goes like this, uh, the semester one, uh, the, 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 there are like one, two, three, four, five, six, six courses. So the first one is survey design and analysis. So it basically teaches you uh, how to effectively prepare uh, questions for uh, collecting data from patients, like uh, how to effectively design a good survey question uh, to collect maximum information from the particular subject. Uh, and the second one is fundamentals of statistical analysis. So uh, most of the students will be having uh, less knowledge of statistical analysis. Uh, and that's not given a big priority in your pharmacy course. Uh, but when, when it comes to the research program, uh, statistics, it's all and everything. So you'll be giving them the fundamentals of statistics, like wh what are the different test type of tests and um, um, or how can the statistical test can be done and how can you manipulate the data and um, um, and what is p-value, what is the power of the test, all these fundamentals will be given uh, about the statistical analysis. And uh, in, in research, basically research is divided into two. One is qualitative and second is quantitative. So um, most, most research, researchers are quantitative and most of the biomedical researchers are quantitative. We, we quantify what we get, the data, quantify the data. But uh, sometimes our research can be quali qualitative. Uh, so uh, it's in, most of them don't know the qualitative research. So they have included the, a special coursework for qualitative research. Uh, like um, it, it won't be giving you the numbers, but this will be giving you the uh, overall idea of where to focus. That's qualitative research. And uh, the next coursework, uh, is research tools and technique. Uh, so um, in in uh, in uh, doing research, uh, you have to use a lot of um, softwares and tools uh, to um, help with your research. Uh, and uh, so um, you have to learn about those tools. So uh, this course will be uh, walking you through the different type of uh, tools that's used in research. Uh, and I have included a sl slide for that, and I'll be explaining the different tools uh, um, after a few slides. And report writing, it, this one is very, very important. Uh, like, um, if you didn't write, you didn't do, do that. That's, there's a saying like that, if you didn't write, you didn't do. So, um, uh, after, uh, after you have done all your research, you have to, uh, present it in uh, and some um, present it, and also you have to um, write it and publish it. So uh, report writing is an uh, uh, it's an effective uh, a needed skill in research field. Uh, you have to write with uh, with uh, with minimal um, language rules and with maximum of um, um, clarifying this, uh, the um, the result. So. Um, and the next one is project management. Project man management is also an important one, which where uh, you manage the entire project effectively. Like you have to do uh, do the timeline of the project, and you have to foresee what are the risks 
that can be happened yeah, that that can happen in future for the research and uh, mitigate the risk uh, so project management is also important so you'll be uh, they'll be teaching you about pro effective project management uh, and uh, in in semester 2 uh, you'll be um, teaching about uh, you'll be taught about uh, population and demography um, so uh, how to express the population demography in your um, research. Um, so that's a vast topic. And uh, advanced statistical procedures like regression, correlation, and um, specificity, sensitivity of the study, uh, and a uh, lot of uh, those things will be taught. And uh, uh, spreadsheet and table management. Uh, so uh, that is very effective in uh, doing research. Um, if you can effectively manage the spreadsheet and table, uh, then uh, you can do the research. With, you can do the data analysis very really easily. So you'll be taught. You'll be taught about the um, uh, MS um, MS Excel and SQL. Uh, those are like uh, uh, table management software. So MS um, Excel, Microsoft Excel is uh, the older, 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 older tool. So all the uh, uh, the like more advanced uh, table management tools are there, like SQL, where uh, you can uh, just enter the data and uh, it will be giving the result as uh, I said. So you need to learn all those software. Then uh, uh, professional communication skill, uh, that's more of a, um, a soft skill. And data evaluation is the is another bigger topic where you you have to uh, you learn to collect the data. Now you have to learn how to evaluate the data and the, uh, get, get the necessary results. And uh, at the end of this semester two, you have to do a capstone project. Um, you have to um, you will be getting a real client, a real real project, and you will be helping that project. And you'll be presenting that project in front of the um, um, uh, program coordinator. And um, then uh, in the term uh, three, it's a uh, co uh, co op work term. It's um, co op means it's like paid internship. Um, it's it's kind of internship, but it's not internship. Um, yeah, internship. You all know that uh, your uh, institution will be placing you somewhere and you'll be doing the internship uh, and coming out. But co-op uh, co is something different. Like uh, you have to you have to find your own employer for doing an internship. Um, the, the, the college or the institution will be the institution will be uh, only guiding you through how to make a good resume, cover letter, and how to do the job hunt. But uh, you have to go out and hunt your internship employer. So that's co op. And that's very effective for uh, international students because uh, you will be getting an uh, exposure of job hunt uh, before you go for the real job hunt. So, um, uh, in, in, and after uh, your co op work term is done, uh, uh, the employer will be sending the evaluation form to your college and uh, uh, the college will be giving you the graduation. So uh, my story um, after uh, grad, um, after my semester two, uh, I was doing my uh, co-op job hunt, and um, I I got um, a co-op uh, work with uh, McMaster University. So McMaster University is a bigger university in Canada, and um, um, uh, the, this McMaster University have different research sites all over Ontario, um, and um, um, I was placed in Collingwood General Marine Hospital, uh, and that that uh, CGMH uh, is a um, education and research site for um, McMaster University. So um, I was placed in there, and uh, I was involved in the uh, all the research is going on the, in the hospital as well as um, rural and medical program is the uh, the program that run by McMaster University in the site of Collingwood General Marine Hospital. So I think you get the understanding of uh, these three things. 
um, so um, rural Ontario medical program is running the uh, research program in Collingwood uh, uh, Hospital and McMaster University is running the Ontario, uh, sorry, rural Ontario medical program. Uh, and uh, in the in the site, there will be a lot of uh, medical residents coming for their residency. And as a, as a part of their residency, they have to do involve involve in a lot of um, uh, research work. Uh, and I have to help the medical residents in their research work. I have to guide them through the all the research protocols, procedure, and how to uh, do that. Uh, uh, and um, um, I'll be uh, evaluating the data and giving them the results and. Uh, I'll be preparing everything for them. Uh, and um, um, that's one of my part, uh, one part of my job. And the second thing is I'll be also involved in the research, uh, the clinical research going on in the uh, hospital. Uh, so Dr. Lisi, uh, Dr. Michael Lisi uh, is the chief of staff of the hospital. So I am directly posted under him uh, um, for the... Um, for running of the research uh, works in the hospital. And um, so the, uh, the research work in hospital will be uh, mainly for two types. One for the quality improvement of the procedures in the hospital. And so the second one is for the academia purpose, uh, like uh, for publishing in the articles. So uh, uh, th those are the two um, works in the hospital. And uh, so now I'm doing three works now. And also I will be also, um, playing a role of navigator uh, in conducting the CME programs. Um, so Collingwood is a small town and there's other small towns nearby. So uh, we'll be coordinating with those towns and like uh, town of Clareview, town of Pesega Beach. So those are other towns nearby. So all these towns come together uh, with uh, this Georgian College is also nearby. Uh, so Georgian College also come together uh, and um, so Collingwood General Marine Hospital, all the towns and the college and McMaster University, they all come together and conduct a research and innovation day. So I'll, I'll, be, I'll be the navigator for the program. So I'll be uh, coordinating all the meetings and um, all the press release, uh, all the work, everything. Uh, and conducting the uh, the one day research uh, research seminar program. Uh, and um, um, on 2019 research day, uh, we uh, got um, Dr. Tak um, uh, He is the um, um, he was nominated for a Nobel Prize once. Uh, he didn't get the Nobel Prize, but he was nominated for Nobel Prize. So we got him as a speaker. Uh, and the topic was uh, focused on cancer. So he has some, he has uh, done his research and found, found out uh, a signaling pathway uh, that is causing breast cancer. So, and uh, for his work, uh, he was nominated for um, a Nobel Prize, but uh, he didn't get the Nobel Prize, but he won, he was nominated for the Nobel Prize. And these are the major projects I was involved in. The first one was, a systemic review on the best process to decontaminate and reuse N95 masks for frontline healthcare workers. So um, uh, we did this project uh, at the start of COVID-19. So there was a huge shortage of N95 masks uh, in, uh, for the healthcare workers. So it was a great crisis at then that, uh, then that time. Uh, and um, uh, we, um, we tried to... procedure uh, and um, um, uh, actually Nebraska University has done that research um, and we have um, they, they have done with UV light and we were uh, we, we were doing it with uh, the UV light with um, some other gas uh, so uh, it was a good um, it was good research but um, um, uh, I wasn't involved in the full part of the research. I was involved only in the first part of the research. Uh, and um, uh, the second one was impact of COVID on community mental health. So um, during uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, 
lot of people went into mental health problem uh, because they were not um, allowed to go outside and have a relaxed mind. So uh, that has uh, in uh, that have uh, increased the frustration uh, in them and as was mental health issues in ma many people. So uh, we were collecting data from the uh, hospital for the mental health issues. So we'll be collecting data from uh, before COVID and after COVID and uh, analyzing that and evaluating the sensitivity and specificity of a uh, new hip fracture assessment tool. So this was also an interesting uh, um, research where um, one of our orthopedic doctor has made a tool um, that um, that tool has some questionnaire and uh, if uh, while, while answering the questionnaire, you can um, you can assess whether the patient has hip fracture or not. Um, so uh, I didn't give you enough in the, in the introduction on this topic. Uh, so in Canada, if someone falls and call 911, uh, so the ambulance comes and they were um, uh, shifting them to the hospital in, nine, uh, in the ambulance, uh, but uh, they don't know whether they have hip fracture or not. So if they have if fracture, they have to uh, transfer the patient to the hospital where, where they have where the hospital have that facility. So to assess that in uh, before uh, earlier, um, this tool was introduced, and uh, uh, so when the nine one one people go to the patient, they can assess uh, they can assess with the questionnaire and um, confirm whether the patient have a hip fracture, and they can shift the patient earlier as possible. Uh, to the hospital where, where they do a fixed, fra fixed fracture, sorry, thanks, hip fracture treatment. And, um, uh, and we were evaluating the sensitivity and specificity of that new tool. Uh, or only after evaluating that, we can uh, use that tool. So we were doing that and it was very successful. And um, uh, we got like 95% sensitivity and 90% specificity. And the next one is comparative nutritional status evaluation of the pre-operative patient using four screening tools. So we were evalu evaluating uh, the patient come for, um, in, in Canada, you cannot go into the hospital and get the surgery done uh, now or then. So uh, you have to wait in the waiting list and you spend your time uh, according to the uh, um, uh, urgency you have, they will evaluate the urgency and they will give you a waiting period. Uh, and in that waiting period, you will be uh, uh, required to do multiple consultation with doctor. So in, in those, uh, during those consultation, uh, you, uh, the patient will be uh, evaluated for their um, nutritional status, um, how nutritious they are and all, all those things. Uh, and our hypothesis was if the patient was uh, undernourished, before surgery, then the recovery will be slower. If the patient is um, uh, well nourished, then the recovery will be faster. So we'll, we first evaluated the uh, uh, nutritional status before surgery. Then we evaluate how fast they are recovering, uh, how less is the post-operative complications are. And uh, uh, we used post screen tools for that. Uh, uh, because uh, we can do a different paper on that uh, by comparing four screening tools. Uh, that's why we use uh, four different tools. Uh, and, um, and the second part of the, uh, this uh, big project is, um, we'll be, uh, uh, oh, sorry, that's another one. So uh, this, this is the uh, uh, nutritional project we did. did. And the, the, the other one is total joint arthroplasty audit. So we'll be auditing all the patients who uh, have gone through the uh, hip, hip or knee, knee replacement surgery and evaluating uh, how well they are recovered after uh, the anesthesia. So there is general anesthesia and spinal anesthesia. So we, we are just auditing which anesthesia um, was better in terms of recovery and pain management. And uh, we got amazing results in that. And, uh, and based on that result, uh, they have already modified the SOP of the hospital in arthroplasty surgery. And uh, pre-operative and post-operative wellness, uh, that is anxiety in surgery. So um, um, like 
how anxious is the patient before surgery and how it's affecting the recovery uh, uh, and uh, how um, well um, and what, what was the anxiety score after surgery also. So uh, like um, just, uh, just evaluating what is the anxiety score before the surgery, what is the anxiety score after the surgery, just evaluating that and then interfering uh, the, the interference with the uh, VR. So it's an interesting project where um, before surgery, we'll be giving uh, the patient uh, the uh, virtual experience of the surgery. And uh, we reassure them that uh, it's nothing, it's simple. And um, we make them go through the VR experience of uh, virtual reality experience of uh, a real surgery. And uh, then um, and we uh, our hypothesis that um, by doing this, the pre-operative anxiety score will go down. And uh, that was our uh, hypothesis. And uh, the, we have done the first part and we are about to do the second part because second part in, involved a lot of technical requirements. So we are waiting suitable um, things uh, for that. So these are the major events uh, uh, I have conducted when I, uh, uh, while I was Hello. working. Alkin? Yeah. Hello, yeah. Alkin, sir. Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, actually, how long it may take? Oh, uh, I'm almost there. I'll, I'll go. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Take your time. Oh, I'm fast. so sorry. Okay. Thank you. It's okay. It's okay. Thank you. So these are the major events uh, uh, I mentioned uh, about the Georgian Pre Health uh, Care Wellness Day. And um, I got uh, the uh, John Fryer Research Award, uh, and these are some pictures of that. And these are the tools I was talking about uh, uh, in research. Uh, so the first one is Power BI. Power BI. It's, an, it's an important tool to analyze data and uh, uh, create infographics to present the data in front of an audience. And Tableau is also an uh, Tableau. It's also an important uh, tool to present the data in front of an audience in visually appealing form. And um, uh, I, S, IBM SPSS is a tool for uh, statistical analysis. And NVivo is a qual, uh, qualitative research analysis tool. And uh, um, MS Office and SQL are table management software. Uh, and um, um, uh, SAS is an um, 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 statistical tool. And uh, Costume Pro and Politics are um, survey design software. And um, uh, EndNote uh, are um, uh, a, a library reference uh, software for your research. So um, I'm just um, running through the tools. Uh, and these are the um, some uh, important libraries uh, for, uh, get, um, for doing the, your um, literature review for research. Uh, Medline, Embase. Program in Hall. And uh, I, I come to the last part. I have included uh, a question in uh, um, a sample question for uh, PBC. Uh, so I'll, I'll just um, read it for you. Uh, GB is a 57 year old male who was diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. GB's medical condition include bipolar disorder. So, So GB has bipolar disorder and uh, he is on maintenance and uh, pre-diabetic and dyslipidemic. Uh, he has been in postural hyperplasia, uh, hyperplasia and uh, uh, GERD. His current medications include lamotrigine. Lamotrigine, you know, um, uh, even though it's um, um, uh, anti-epileptic, it, it can be given for bipolar disorder. And uh, Rose was starting for his dyslipidemia. And tamsulosin for his uh, BPH, uh, benign prostate hyperplasia, uh, and finus derived for his uh, BPH again, uh, and pandaprosol for GERD. So the question is Does GP require an or oral anticoagulant or, or antiplatelet therapy? So, uh, uh, according to the chance, uh, so uh, you have to learn about chance score before answering this question. So, according to the chance score, um, if, if, if the patient is having a uh, 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 score about two, then they have to take the anticoagulant or anti uh, platelet therapy. Uh, so if they have liver disease, kidney disease, or hypertension, uh, or uh, bleeding disease, or uh, stroke, then they, have, they, they will get the score. But 
uh, if you go look at the questions, um, uh, you cannot see any of uh, any of those. So the score is zero. So the answer would be no. GB does not occur anticoagulant or anti platelet therapy. So uh, here its answer is here, and you can read the options, and there is a takeaway point about that. So you can read uh, when you have time. I'm doing a marathon right now, uh, and um, uh, the second I have into one more question. Uh, you are working as a clinical pharmacist, a family health uh, uh, team. One of the nurse practitioners approached you to ask for your input about uh, one of her patients. Uh, it's 39 year old male who has been dealing with chronic back pain following a work related incident past seven months. He has been on immediate release hydro hydromorphone uh, every three four hours as needed for the past three months. Uh, LP has found uh, this to be quite effective in dealing with this pain. Uh, and decrease his pain from 7 out of 10 to 2 out of 10. In addition to his physiotherapy, on average, he takes about 6 tablets daily. Today, the nurse practitioner would like to switch into a longer-acting opioid to help better control of his uh, pain and uh, more convenient dosage. And uh, he also has uh, anxiety disorder, attention hyperactivity disorder, and, uh, um, uh, um, and he's taking... Um, uh, amphetamine uh, drug and um, um, biloxetine. So uh, the question is, what uh, breakthrough dose can we recommend? So um, I will uh, go through a quick marathon right now. And uh, so while using the opioid, opioid by, by calculating the opioid dosage, uh, you have to uh, give the patient first immediate release opioid uh, and ask him to take whenever he get pain. And uh, uh, and if he takes six tablet uh, a day of uh, if if he take two mg six tablet a day, then uh, the maintenance dose will be six into two, uh, like twelve mg per day. So we'll be giving him twelve mg tablet uh, extended release. And also with that, we'll be giving him the breakthrough dose. That means ten percent of this twelve uh, mg uh, will be. Uh, 10% of the 12 mg dosage will be given to him uh, if he get breakthrough pain, like uh, a pain in between, he can take this breakthrough dose. So that will be like 2 mg or something. Uh, uh, and that's breakthrough dose. So uh, that, that's the question here. And uh, the answer will be, uh, answer is here. So the correct answer is uh, uh, break through those for LP because it's ten percent of his total daily dose. So you can uh, read it yourself when you have time, uh, and um, uh, and that I think that's it. Uh, thank you for giving me a wonderful opportunity uh, to present um, about my journey and different opportunities in uh, Canada for pharmacy grad. And um, um, I'm sorry for um, taking a lot of time and I think um, I'll be a little bit help of help for you and um, um, if you are mainly focusing on um, to become a pharma uh, pharmacist uh, then you don't need to um, focus a lot on pharmacology please do focus more on pharmacotherapy and uh, the pharmacology and pharmacotherapy won't be interfering a lot uh, for example uh, for um, ADHD, attention deficit, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, uh, so it's hyperactivity. So um, by if you are thinking logically, uh, you are not, you won't be giving stimulants to those patients. But for those patients, we are giving stimulants like amphetamine medication. So um, um, I, I pointed out that because always pharmacology and pharmacotherapy won't be uh, coming together. Um, so. Uh, if you're focusing more to be a clinical pharmacist, focus more on pharmacotherapy. Uh, and um, that's it. Thank you for the big opportunity. Thank you so much, sir. It's a wonderful and informative session. Uh, many things we came to know regarding Canada and its regulations, even the geographical uh, specifications from your presentation. Thank you for the being a, such a thing uh, for this day. And we have some uh, questions uh, from a chat box. I think you can access the chat box. Okay. Yes, sir. Or else I can read it for you. Oh, yeah, please. Thank you. Okay, sir. Uh, 
the question uh, from tejashwini what are all the recommended step for indian pharmacy students if they want to choose their profession in pharmaco vigilance over there in a canada for pharmaco vigilance uh, yes sir yeah for, for pharmaco vigilance uh, you don't need to get your pharmacy uh, license in canada so uh, all you need is your uh, you have a good, you must have good resume and you must have good soft skills for the pharmaco vigilance job for like attention to details and um all those things and also uh, if you want to uh, easily get uh, involved in pharmaco vigilance industries so there there is uh, some uh, clinical um drug safety uh, one year programs that offered in a uh, pharmacy uh, sorry canadian colleges um but um the thing is that you uh, those those colleges are not funded by government those are private colleges so uh if you want to you can take the course and go there and study those those course but the thing is you won't get a uh, stay back there so after completing completion of the course you have to come back to india um but um uh, if you if you get a permanent residency in canada and then you take up this course uh you will be getting a lot of grants for that uh, for studying um canada government is so generous um they um if for for the uh, for the permanent residents they will be giving lot of grants for them to study and um and also uh, many extra funding if you have kids um because uh, having a kid and studying is very difficult so uh they will be the government will be giving you extra funding to manage your kids uh and uh, so uh, after getting permanent residency you can uh, enroll in those course and get uh, easily involved in pharmaco vigilance industries Yes, sir. Thank you so much. One more question from uh, Humaira. That uh, apart from clinical pharmacist, is there any other programs in clinical side like residential programs? Is there any available programs in Canada apart from a clinical uh, pharmacist? Um, the clinical one will be clinical pharmacist, uh, or um, like involving with patient is. Um, um if you if if your job is um involved with patient um uh, interference then it's clinical so um only the clinical pharmacy will be more clinical and if you are uh, focused on the um pharmacological thing um you can do research on pharmacology um and for that you can do a uh, pg in ph- uh, pharmacology um and there is two type of pgs one with the thesis and one without the thesis so you can choose uh, according to the university whatever your preference is uh, and if it's clinical it's only a pharmac- pharmacist okay sir hello hello yeah sir please unmute please unmute. hello my question is regarding your course only what is the duration of the course and scholarship where they are sorry uh, your voice is breaking up but i heard i heard that uh, what is the duration of my course um, yes sir so yeah, uh, duration of your course a duration of your course duration and is there any course, scholarship any available, available for this? Available for uh, yes uh, so um, the duration of my course was uh, one and a half years uh, like uh, three semester um, so um, uh the third semester is only for internship co-op work and um, um the the granting or uh, the scholarship if, if the you can get scholarship only after if you get into the dean's list and you can apply for a small scholarship but you won't be getting a lot of scholarship and you'll be getting a $1000 uh, $2000 scholarship because you are international students uh there is a lot of limitations uh Uh, but if you are a, a permanent resident then you have a lot of scholarships hi dr algin wilson hi good morning uh, uh, good morning uh, how are you uh, i'm i'm doing great how about you yeah i'm fine i do have just a question for you regarding a career of themsel in canada uh, sorry i i didn't get that uh, i'm asking you about uh, what is the scope of msl in canada so it's a medical sensation uh, oh yeah medical sensation yeah uh, so um um it it's 
highly paid job and uh, uh, but you cannot be an MS so I think that was a bad one uh, medical license right so uh, you cannot be directly getting a medical license job uh, you have to um, get into uh, a, a pharmaceutical company and then you grow as a medical license uh, but yes. it's not a, a start away job I but it's it's highly paid. So uh, is there any difference between MSL and sales representative or are they both? Sales? Yeah, you, you can start as a sales representative and you can grow as uh, MSL. It's basically like you are going uh, as an MSL, you are going uh, to the um, physicians, doctors, um, uh, and um, you'll be uh, giving all the uh, um, necessary information uh, to the physician, doctor, and everyone. Okay, I do have one more question regarding, uh, uh, so if suppose uh, we are like uh, moving to the Canada and uh, on the basis of the master's degree, so which is the highest uh, demanding master's current in Canada, whether like in a public sure. health or health informatics or something so like that, can you just- Yeah, yeah there's a the the swap for health informatics, uh, uh, but, but for that uh, you require a license, that's a different licensing procedure. Um, and um, uh, not only pharmacists, but uh, uh, any health professionals or even uh, an engineering graduate can and uh, get uh, a health informatics license. It's a different licensing procedure, um, but uh, and also it's a uh, you have to take up a uh, two year uh, course and get the license done. Okay, sir, that's a very good answer. <laughs> And uh, we have two couple more uh, questions, sir. Uh, what about the scope of drug regulatory affairs in Canada? Uh, yeah, uh, and for that also, there is a program, regulatory affairs course. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, uh, and fortunately, uh, and fortunately, uh, that uh, is um, that is available in government funded colleges, and uh, you can take up regulatory affairs course and uh, come to Canada, but. Uh, Getting uh, um, getting admitted to the program is very difficult and it's very competitive in Canada. Uh, so uh, you can um, you can make a good SOP um, uh, statement of purpose um, and send to the college and you can get admission. And if you get admission and uh, you pass the program, uh, there is a high scope for regulatory affairs. Yes, sir. I think. Um, the one college I saw the program is in Algokin College on Darien. If okay. someone wants to specifically search, it's Algokin College. Algokin. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. And I think Thank almost all the, all the questions, questions we have, we have been cleared. Been cleared. Uh, some, some of, of the, the questions, questions if we are following the follow complete the video, complete video, we can uh, uh, came to know the answers and. Uh, now I am handing the session to Dr. Robin George, sir. Thank you. Uh, dear Alvin, sir, it was a very patient session, actually, to be said. You have the different. Hello. You have uh, started with the different, uh, the different provisions in. Uh, Excuse Canada me, sir. And how to Excuse me, sir. PPC exams. Excuse me, sir. sir, your voice was not clear. Uh, sir, Dr. Alvin Wilson, I do have a last question before the meeting was ending. So, do farm base enter into the role of uh, logistic supply chain management? Um. Uh, yeah, I think so, because uh, if you uh, get the job in the wholesaler of the uh, uh, drug, like Mechas in Canada, um, Mechas in Canada is a wholesaler in uh, Canada. Um, so um, if you, uh, I think they have a lot of opportunities uh, for logistical thing. So yeah, of course, you can also enter in logistical um, career if you choose to. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again.
Dr. Algin, uh, so we thank you so much because you had a long hour session. You have uh, took it very patiently, slow, steady, and in a very clear cut uh, way for our students. And you have explained from the geography, different climates, which provisions they can choose itself. And from there to the interesting tourist, very nice views and areas of the Canada from there you came to the different pharmacy systems uh, where the opioid crisis methadone clinic where, where we have the roles and also regarding the various steps of PPC, MCQ, OSCE, jurisprudence. So it was a very clear session and through your life experience and uh, your experience how you reached to this. Uh, we are so happy to uh, get you to be here with us and uh, now I request uh, Dr. B. Jodi, Madam, uh, PharmD coordinator, to give. Uh, Sunil, am I audible? Yes, Madam. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Robin. A respected principal, sir. Uh, today's international speaker, faculty, students, and most valuable delegates. Good afternoon to everyone. Myself, Dr. Jyoti, Professor, PharmD Coordinator in Seven Hills College of Pharmacy. On behalf of Seven Hills College of Pharmacy and its entire fraternity, I feel immense pleasure to pro vote, uh, propose vote of thanks to Dr. Algin Wilson, PharmD Research Assistant Postgraduate Certification Program, McMaster University, Collingwood, Ontario, Canada. I want to express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Wilson, who has paid his precious time from his busy schedule to grace the occasion and enlighten all of us with prospective career options for international pharmacy graduates in Canada in this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. I would further extend the hearty thanks to our chairman, Madam, Mrs. Sumlata Garu, for her continuous support to conduct this type of seminars and webinars. Thank you, ma'am. I would like take this opportunity to express my deep regards to our principal, sir, Dr. M. Niranjan Babu Garu, principal and professor of Seven Hills College of Pharmacy, for being a constant source of motivation and guiding force in our endeavor and efforts to excel in the field of pharmacy education Thank you, sir, for your support and blessing to us. I would especially thank to Dr. Robin George, PharmD, Associate Professor, Seven Hills College of Pharmacy, to his valuable arrangement and unfaltering support to conduct this webinar. Thank you, Robin. And next, I would like to express my thanks to Dr. Sunil, Assistant Professor, Seven Hills College of Pharmacy, for his constant and continuous support in technically and for successful completion of this webinar. And I would like to extend my thanks to other PharmD faculties, Dr. Sirisha, Dr. Divya, Dr. Bhagyashri, for their continuous help for successfully completion of this webinar. And I would like to extend my gratitude to all professors, HODs, faculties of SSCP, who have helped us to complete this program successfully. So finally, I want to express my sincere thanks to students, delegates. Without you, this program is not succeed, right? So once again, thank you one and all. Thank you for this opportunity. One oh, second, ma'am. Jyoti, ma'am. Yes, Sunil. Ma'am, I'm requesting you to present the certificate of appreciation to our today's resource person. Uh, sure. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, is my screen is visible? Yes, now visible, Robbie. Yes. Sir, please take us a token of gratitude of a certificate of appreciation from our side, and we will mail you the same to you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. So thank you, Dr. Wilson, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Sir, uh, any end notes from your side? Um, yeah, um, like uh, as as you all see um, how uh, my journey is and how um, you 
you can uh, be get licensed licensed in Canada. Um, it's even if it's difficult, it's possible. So uh, focus and um, dream, as your seminar say, dream. And um, 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 like um, for just just one advice to all the graduates who are uh, going to um, study um, for the exams and everything. So um, don't try to uh, study everything at once uh, uh, for pharmacology or pharmacotherapy. It's like painting a wall, like the first coat, uh, just paint the basic, then um, the second coat will be, uh, after each coat, it will, it, it will be, sorry, it will be getting more brighter. So it's about repetition. So repeat on your coursework. Thank you. Thank you, Algin. Thank you for boosting the students' uh, confidence that uh, even this difficult task is possible for you. The way you have explained, so many have done already, so many are yet to do. So our students also can do it easily. And uh, you are one of the most example and inspiration for them. Uh, thank you for your valuable guidance, uh, time and uh, patience. So with a thank you once again, we are going to end the program. We will go for the national anthem. Thank you for leaving the program. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you delegates, so much. once again. Uh, you can uh, see you the can feedback see link in the chat box. And once you fill the feedback link, you can get the certificate. And uh, in YouTube uh, live also, uh, we have pinned the message of uh, feedback link. Once you fill the feedback link, you will get the certificate. Thank you so much. And if any more query, we can contact to us. And uh, let's end up the session with National Anthem. Thank you so much for joining for the webinar. Janagana mana ati na ate jane bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab Sindh Gujarat Maratha Davida Uttala Vanga Vindya Himachala Yamuna Ganga Chala Jala Dhitaranga Tava Shubha Nami Jage Tava Shubha Aashish Maage Gahe Tava Jaya Gatha Jana Gana Mangala Dayaka Jaya He Bharat Bhagya Vidhata Jaya He Thank you, dear delegates. You can leave the meeting.